persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in, an, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, would you join me in prayer? And Sue, would you kindly spotlight me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, you may know this, when you're new in a job or for that matter, when you're new in a neighborhood or in a family system, you have a way of asking awkward questions. I've been doing this a lot in the last seven weeks that I have been the minister here at the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Yes, it has already been seven weeks, or maybe I should say, yes, it's only been seven weeks. <clears throat> During that time, I have been asking a lot of questions, not for the purpose of making anybody uncomfortable, but just because I do not understand what is going on. So as a result, I have asked awkward questions about the budget, about the endowment, about job descriptions, about the practices of past ministers, about how meetings are run, about what a cluster is, uh, about why certain things are stored in certain closets and other things are not anywhere to be found. All of these questions uh, I have found uh, are things that are worth asking, but not always questions that have answers. So you could say that I am somewhat on a roll with all of these awkward questions. So in the same spirit, I thought this morning, I would ask yet another awkward question, not just about Westminster Presbyterian Church, but about the entire Christian religion. You ready for this? Here's my question. What is the point? What's the point? What is the purpose of all of this, the budgets and the building, all of the time and committees and conversations, all of these rituals and readings, practices and prayers? What actually is the point of the Christian life? Have you ever wondered that? Yes? Do, do you have an answer to that question? This maybe would be a good time where you turn to the person next to you or say to yourself what you think is the point of all of this that we're doing. It's not an easy question, although it is an obvious one. And part of the reason why it is not so easy to answer is that Jesus doesn't really lay out his ministry with a clear statement of goals and objectives. He doesn't really tell us straight off what is the point in a way that we could, you know, check those things off the list when we have achieved them. Now, when Jesus at the start of his ministry tells everybody what he's all about, in all of the gospels, he puts it this way, repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. That's his mission statement. That's his declaration of what he's all about. Gospel of Matthew that we just read tends to use the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of Luke tends to use the phrase, the kingdom of God. Scholars tend to think of those phrases as interchangeable that phrase, that, that picture of the life that Jesus was calling us into is somehow so simple and yet so complex. Repent, Jesus says. So clearly Jesus is calling his disciples to some kind of change, repentance being a re 
orientation, turning your face in another direction, headed in a different direction. So there's change involved with this invitation. But the kingdom of God, what does that mean? <laughs> what, what does the kingdom of heaven look like? And what would it look like for us to face that, to reorient our lives in that direction? As soon as we ask that question, as soon as we start poking at that phrase, the kingdom of God, that phrase, the kingdom of heaven, we find ourselves knee deep in parables. Those perplexing, evocative, disturbing, playful stories that Jesus tells throughout the gospels. For the next three weeks, we're going to be considering some of these parables which are found in the 13th chapter of Matthew, a chapter that is just filled with one parable after another. The parable that Charles just read so beautifully for us this morning uh, is one that tells of a sower, somebody who's sowing seeds. Now the sower's seeds fall on a path, they fall on rocky ground, they fall among thorns, and they fall in good soil. And there is no mystery to the result. Just as we would predict, some of the soil grows and some of the soil doesn't. Some of it bears fruit and some of it doesn't. Now, <clears throat> there are 40 parables in the Christian scriptures, and only two of those parables have explanations attached to them. And this parable of the sower, at least as it's told in the Gospel of Matthew, is one of the ones that has an explanation, the second part of our reading today. According to this explanation, this parable is all about different kinds of people who, quote, hear the word of the kingdom. Okay, so different people respond to the word of the kingdom in different ways. In some, it takes root and it bears fruit, and in some, it does not. Now, if this parable is meant to help us understand what the point of the Christian life is, if this parable helps to explain what it means to reorient our lives towards the kingdom, then we have to ask an awkward question. We have to ask a really awkward question. What is this parable telling people to do? I don't know about you, but I have heard more than a few sermons on this parable in my lifetime. And most of the time, those sermons are sort of an exhortation, an encouragement to be good soil. And in fact, as a child, I even learned a song uh, that began, Lord, help me be good soil. The idea is that, you know, preachers could turn this parable into some sort of encouragement to do things like pray or study or best yet for preachers to go to worship because all of those things they tell you will be, make you more receptive to God's word, which is sown in you. It's like tilling and aerating the soil. But here's my problem with all of those preachers and all of those sermons. Here's my problem with that interpretation of this scripture. There is, <clears throat> there is no indication in this parable that the soil can improve itself. You cannot become better soil. The rocky ground cannot get up and go move over to a better area. That's just not how soil works. There's some soil that's going to be better for growing stuff in, and then there's other soil that just is too rocky. And that's the way soil is. And so this parable really cannot be construed as a call to self-improvement. So what's the point? What's the point of the parable? If we go with that explanation, if we go with the second part of today's reading, the explanation that's offered in the Gospel of Matthew, I think this parable just teaches us to see the world as made up of certain kinds of people, some of whom are productive and some of whom are just not. 
So then there's this temptation to conclude that the point of the Christian life is to figure out which is which, to figure out which person is this kind of soil and which person is that kind of soil? Who's worth your time, your energy, your effort? Who is going to be productive? And while we're doing all of that discernment, while we're trying to figure that out, <clears throat> we always have this other eye on ourselves, trying to figure out whether we're productive, whether we're good soil or whether we're really, in the end, just a waste of seed. Now, that description of the Christian life, I know, can sound very harsh. But let's be honest, it is deep, deep in the Reformed tradition, the theological heritage of the Presbyterian Church. John Calvin himself called all of those good soil people the elect and encouraged everybody to do good works so the world would know that they are the elect, that they are the ones who God has deemed worthy, productive, and bearing good fruit. And even if we reject hardcore Calvinism, let's face it, our, that, that idea is deep in our own culture. Most of us actually see the world this way. We try to find the people who are worth our effort, the projects that are worth our time. We try to be kind to the people who will repay our kindness. We try to be nice to the people who will reciprocate our friendship. To put it bluntly, most of us are really basically only interested in sowing seeds in good soil. But friends, <clears throat> here's what is challenging about this parable. Here's what's interesting about this parable. The sower in this parable does not play by those rules. The sower in this parable sows seeds in the good soil, where I'm sure the sower can expect that good fruit will grow and result, <clears throat> but the sower doesn't stop there. The sower keeps sowing seeds. The sower puts seeds in rocky ground. The sower puts seeds where the ground is already growing thistles. And most surprising of all, the sower puts seeds on pavement. The sower puts seeds on the path where there isn't even the slightest chance that anything is going to grow. Why? Why? Who would do farming like that? Who would sow seeds like that? Who would seed their lawn and continue right on across their driveway? If you saw somebody doing that, wouldn't you wonder why? Like this is this is the point where if we were here uh, together in, in 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 real time and in real space, I would love to hear your responses. I would love to hear your theories <clears throat> on what could possibly explain the actions of someone who goes about sowing seeds this way. <clears throat> I mean, maybe it's that the sower believes that there are I don't know little spots between the rocks between the thorns, where something might grow up after all. Maybe this is a sower which sees birds that eat the seeds as just as important as the seeds that grow in the ground. And maybe the sower knows a thing or two about how the birds will actually spread those seeds and plant them elsewhere. I don't know if there's a clear agricultural explanation for what's going on in this parable. <clears throat> But one thing is for sure, this sower is not worried about conserving seed. This sower is not focused on maximizing productive outcome. This sower must have way more seed, way more seed than the good ground could possibly contain. This sower has seed in such abundance that the sower could just throw the seed around in a way that most of us 
with our very careful assessments of what our efforts should go into and, and, and what would actually bear fruit for us. This sower doesn't work like that. This sower ignores those calculations and takes some kind of pleasure just in the act of sowing, just in the act of throwing the seed around regardless of where it's going to fall. Friends, maybe we have been looking at this parable the wrong way. Maybe the message here about the kingdom of God, maybe the clues here about the point of the whole Christian life lie not with the seeds, not with the soil, but with the sower. What if we spent less time judging the worthiness of others and judging our own worthiness and more time just focused on the generosity of God? What if we spent less energy punishing other people, punishing ourselves when we don't quite measure up, and spent more energy just celebrating God's abundance? What if we put our time and our energy into receiving God's love and letting it flow through us into this entire hurting world? As citizens of this world, we learn that love is something that we must achieve or merit or earn because of our usefulness or our potential. It's so easy to read the parable that way because it confirms our worst suspicions about who God really is. But what if we are actually called to be citizens of the kingdom of God? residents of God's realm, where love is spread like this wild sower who sows the seeds on any kind of ground that is in front of her. What if love is not a prize that's awarded at the end of a race, but rather, love is the language and the law of this world that we are called to abide in. Love is the air we breathe in the kingdom of God. Love is the water that we swim in. It's sown with such joyful abundance that it falls in every crack and crevice. Friends, how would our lives be different if that was our focus. How would our lives be different if we reoriented and faced that kind of a sower? There is so much sadness in this world. There's so much that's broken beyond our understanding of how to fix it. There are so many lost causes, so many damaged people, so many devastated places. If we stood back and if we just evaluated the potential of the world around us, friends, many days we would be likely to give up. We just give up and go home. If we stood back and evaluated our own potential, if we stood back and saw what we were really capable of and judged it, most likely many of us would give up on ourselves. But here's the thing, Jesus came to declare to us, he said that his purpose is to tell us that the kingdom of God has come near, the kingdom of God is at hand, which is to say that God doesn't stand far back God doesn't step away. God hasn't turned God's back on us. Hear this good news, the best news of all the good news of the gospel. God has come close and sown the seeds of love all over this world. God is good, friends, and worthy of our praise. Amen. We'll continue our worship with the hymn, Let the Whole Creation Cry.
And now let us continue with worship, with our prayer together. Let's begin our time of prayer with a few minutes of quiet, opening our hearts to God, and just simply inviting God to be present and to invite our own hearts to be present to God in this time. Gracious, loving God, God of all goodness, God of hope and joy, God of justice, God of peace. Thank you for this day, God, and for the invitation to lift all that is on our hearts to you. Thank you for the promise that you hear our prayers. Thank you for the promise that even when we don't know what to pray, that the spirit cries out within us with sighs too deep for words. God, we are people who have been blessed in so many ways. In this time of year with so much green, so much growing, so many flowers and birds, for lakes and streams, for beaches and oceans. We give you thanks for this natural world and for all the beauty that continues to amaze us, surprise us, delight us. We give you thanks for the beauty of human faces, human voices, for the hands that have reached out and held us this week, physically and virtually, for the people who have accompanied us, physically and virtually, we give you thanks. God, hear us as we lift up to you now, our prayers of celebration, our joys, big and small. Friends, lift your prayers silently or aloud. God, we also come to you as people with heavy hearts. People who are carrying burdens, sometimes front and center in our lives, so much so that we feel like those burdens arrive in the room before we ever do. Some deeply buried, hidden. God, we give you thanks for the invitation to unburden ourselves and our prayers with you, our time with you, and our relationship with you. God, we pray for all of those who are sick, those who are ill with chronic illnesses, those who have been set with sudden illnesses. We pray especially for all of those who are ill with COVID-19 and all of those who care for them. Guide our country, God, guide our city, guide each of us as we seek to live in a way that fosters health and wholeness and healing. God, we pray with all of those who grieve, all of those who are losing family members without being able to be by their side. God, we pray for the family of Sean Hood, especially this morning. Our heart breaks, 
our heart breaks, God, at the loss of a young man. We pray for all of those who are separated from their family, be it in nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, and prisons, or just simply at a distance that cannot be crossed or traveled right now. God, help us to find ways to connect, to reach out even across the barriers that separate us. With these prayers, God, we pray for our church, especially those in our church community who are struggling, who are in need of healing. We pray for Margaret. We pray for Felicia. We pray for all of those whose names we have read on the prayer chain, all of those who come to mind now. God, hear us as we name friends, family, places and people for whom we have concern. We lift these prayers to you now silently or aloud. All of these prayers, God, we offer in the great and good name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son, who taught us to pray when we gather, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine, Lord, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now I think we have a musical meditation.
And now, friends, we'll have a moment from a, it's a moment for mission. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes, I'm unmuted. Uh, a moment for mission uh, brought to us by Nancy Ost on behalf of the Earth Care team. Can we spotlight Nancy? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi there, everybody. So, so many of us are not aware that for some time now, there's been a dedicated church, a group of dedicated church members who've been working on getting Westminster certified as an earth care church. Now, out of this endeavor at the urging of the Randalls and Judy Hartley, Last year, a study group formed to discuss the book, Climate Church, Climate World. This group was so energized by our discussions that we formed the Westminster Earth Care team, which now includes, there were others that came and went, but now includes Paul and Margaret Randall, Judy Hartley, Sue Shell, Pete and Dodie Siegel, Ned and Patricia Trudeau, Alan Tedrow, Leif Hartmark, Elizabeth McMillan, Carolyn Smith, myself, and now Pastor Heather. One of the areas in which we were lacking in order to qualify as an earth care church has been education. So, so far we qualify as far as recycling, reusing and reducing, and this past year Westminster signed on to receive part of our energy from a local solar farm. The team was excitedly making plans to share our ideas and activities with the congregation for the celebration of Earth Day in April when the world came to a halt with the COVID-19 virus. However, even though we couldn't share our excitement with you at that time, the Earth Care team has remained connected and began to hold Zoom meetings to discuss how to proceed. And we have a new plan. In a few moments, you will enjoy a short video celebrating the abundant beauty of God's creation that exists near and around Albany. Our team believes that first we each must renew our awe of the natural world with which we are so blessed. Then we can work together to fix it where needed. I have to apologize to those that don't have camera access to see the photos, but please enjoy the accompanying music played by Darhan on the harp. Then two weeks from now on July 26, we are trying out something new, a virtual second hour. But fear not, it is not an hour. <laughs> we are calling it the terrific 20 minutes that is. So please plan to stay that day for the breakout groups because each group will be hosted by a member or two of the Earth Care team. Each of us will be encouraged to remember and share beautiful moments we have had in God's creation. And we will begin to delve into the question, why should we as people of faith care about creation? Now relax and enjoy the view. Thank you, Nancy. And now let me invite Charles to give us the invitation to 
our offering to our church this morning. Hi. Uh, the reasons uh, uh, Walid and I, we continue to submit our offerings is because uh, we know that everything we have is not our own, but a gift, from, uh, a gift and a blessing from God. And we are called to be stewards of what God has given to us. And we also continue to submit our offerings to Westminster Presbyterian Church because we are aware that despite our being unable to physically be present uh, within the church to worship, uh, the church continues to have operational expenses and financial obligations to meet, uh, in including ministries uh, that are so vital to sowing the gospel seed um, or sowing the seed as Pastor Heather mentioned. Uh, so we invite you to uh, uh, join us in continuing to support Westminster Church. Thank you, Charles. And thank you all for your gifts and your tithes and your many ways in which you continue to bless and serve this community and the community around us and this world. Friends, as we come to the end of our worship service, let's sing this terrific hymn together. Let all things now living to the tune of the ash grove. receive this benediction from yet another Rhys Rohrwacher. This is one of my first memories of Westminster when I first moved to Albany and just stumbled into this church one morning for worship. Paul Rhys Rohrwacher was preaching that Sunday and he ended the service with this beautiful sung benediction. I remembered it, loved it so much that I asked him to record it for me and he'll send us forth this morning. As you go on your way, may God go with you. May God go before you to show you the way. May God go behind you to encourage you beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over, within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, 
Son, and Spirit, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. Friends, uh, I, I keep feeling like we need a credit roll uh, at the end of our worship service. Um, but I, I really do want to thank uh, Dara and Reese Rohrbacher this morning for um, stepping in while Al is away for July and August and just not only bringing us into worship with music, but bringing us back into our sanctuary, uh, playing that beautiful piano we have upstairs and uh, coordinating the singers and the guitarist and the flute player. It's, it was just a lovely morning for music. So thank you, Darren. And I really want to say thanks to Sue Shell and Jessica Chamberlain, who are our tech team this morning behind the scenes. So many people to thank for these Zoom services. It truly, truly takes a village to put this together. We're going to take a short break now but please don't go away because we would love to meet you, greet you, and give you the opportunity to meet and greet each other in some breakout rooms. One last thing before our break. You may have seen that last little announcement, uh, that slide that said Westminster Game Night. That is actually tonight. Now, I have heard a rumor that Presbyterians are not really known for their ability to party. 
I, I don't know if, if that's true, but uh, this tonight is going to be a little bit of a Zoom party, albeit with a Presbyterian flavor. We have put together some trivia questions for you and categories include Bible riddles and Presbyterian celebrities. How could you resist? There's a link for the Zoom for the game night tonight at five on the website. Just come back to Zoom and hang out with us for a little bit more tonight and we're gonna have some fun together, which is a really important part of being a community. And we've been working so hard. Let's take a break and enjoy each other. Okay, friends, a brief break, and then we are going to uh, go to our little rooms together. It just happened. I think they just do it to us. <laughs> 